Okay. So before we get going, Matt, could you give us the numbers on this one? Yep. So this is number 13 in the 1970s, um, number three in 1971, and 46 overall. And on Rolling Stone's list, it was two ahead of Neil Young's after the gold rush at number 88. Wow. And we should say that this is Hunky Dory by uh, oh, yes. David Bowie. Yep. I, I, sorry, uh, that's, yeah. Yep. Hunky Dory. And it's also, I should say, it's uh, Bowie's second highest rated album on best ever albums behind Ziggy Stardust. Gotcha, which is the album that follows this one. Mm-hmm. Um, I am not normally the long bio guy here. The problem with Bowie is that, like, in the 70s, every single one of his albums has about 9,000 things that happened in between them. So I'm going to try my best to do since the last time we saw David Bowie on this. So since the last time we talked about David Bowie in 1969, when we covered his either self-titled David Bowie album or Space Oddity, depending on how you want to refer to that album, the blue one with his head sort of just... Uh, disembodied on the front of it. Um, So Hunky Dory, this album is actually not the next album after that one, which was his second album. There was an album in between The Man Who Sold the World, um, an album I love um, that we didn't cover that is a very hard rocking uh, guitar album. Very different than this one. Uh, I think probably in the modern context, or at least for a certain generation of folks that came later, probably best known for, I think, Nirvana covering The Man Who Sold the World on The Unplugged Show. Um, But uh, sort of represented David Bowie going like full Mark Boland T-Rex style electric guitar and leaning into that type of sound. Um, That album was better received in the United States than it was in the UK and actually led to David Bowie touring the United States. Um, And David Bowie touring the United States was a pretty seminal moment for him because he looked at it as the first time that he sort of was in the extended world besides England and consciously connecting with it. And he would actually spend a lot of time living in the United States um, from the early to mid 70s at you know living in different spots um for better or worse once he gets to la because that is infamously kind of when he hits rock bottom uh with his drug use um but was still making very interesting music we'll talk about many of those albums down the road but this is the beginning of his love affair at that time with the united states um and yeah so he was touring during that time uh One of the things you'll notice on this album is there are three songs very specifically to three American icons. And this was done very, uh, this was done on purpose. Um, When Bowie was in the United States, he sort of wanted to write songs that reflected some of the people that he thought were cultural icons. Did you guys happen to catch who those three icons were? Bob Dylan. Yep, that is one. <laughs> Andy Warhol. Yeah. Correct. I didn't get. To, I didn't get the third because that wasn't the the third was the name wasn't in the I, title of the song. I, I was gonna say I figured that would be the hard one. The third one was Lou Reed. Was the third one he was there? Do you have any oh. idea which song? Queen it, bitch. Yep. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> is it really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's uh he he loved as as you might imagine. Which album from the Velvet Underground do you think David Bowie? Uh, particularly was enraptured by. Oh, God, probably White Light, White Heat. White Light, White Heat. Matt, you are correct. See, that's what me and David Bowie are like yep. this. You guys share yeah. that. You, you have very similar uh, <laughs> similar uh, 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 aesthetic. Aesthetics, aesthetics. Yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. So, all right. So things to know about this album. Um, it was co-produced by David Bowie and Ken Scott. Uh, do, you re- for, do you remember who Ken Scott was from last week, guys? Shit from last week? He was the engineer on George Harrison's All Things Must Pass. So he actually brought in a couple tricks from that album to this album. I did not know that while I was listening to it, so I didn't get a chance to hear for those things specifically. But I have to say, I did not necessarily think, you know, this reminds me of All Things Must Pass. I was listening to this album. Well, there's also so much personnel on that record that I was like, all the names just blended together. (laughs) <laughs> yes, it's, a, it's got a little bit of that. Uh, the This marks the beginning of his, uh, th- well, it's a four-piece band besides him in it. One of the members is Rick Wakeman from Yes, who oh. if you remember when I did the Yes, he's on this, on the piano. He's actually playing the same piano that Paul McCartney um, played on Hey Jude and that Queen would later play on Bohemian Rhapsody. 
That's the key, the piano he used wow. for this album. If you remember, he was asked to join the what would soon be the Spiders from Mars, the David yeah. Bowie backing band, and he decided to take the offer from Yes instead. But he is on this album. The rest of the band is uh, Trevor uh, Boulder from Bass, uh, Mick Woodmansey on the drums, and Mick Ronson, who was a guitar player um, who was also on uh, the previous album. They actually had a falling out and, you know, basically the re- the band from that album, The Man Who Sold the World and Bowie had a falling out, but he actually, after, I think it was seven months, seven or eight months later, um, decided he needed Mick Ronson's guitar sound for this album. And Mick Ronson's guitar sound is the guitar sound that you hear um, in sort of this classic Bowie period. Um, you know, the album before this, this one, Ziggy Stardust, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the Mick Ronson guitar you're hearing there. Okay, so that's the band that's here. They would eventually become the famous Spiders from Mars on the Siggy Stardust album. They're not named as such here. Um, this album marks a shift uh, from the guitar hard rock of his last album into the mellow piano pop rock. He actually composed all of these songs on the piano. Um, and after the U.S. tour, he wrote most of the songs for this album. Some had been germinated before, but most were here. And most of the songs for Ziggy Stardust during a pretty pretty prolific period of writing. Um, a lot of critics refer to this album as the album where Bowie becomes like Bowie, the, the sort of uh, ever-changing um, entity. Some people don't trace it till Ziggy Stardust after this. Some people say it actually goes back to the man who sold the world before this. But um, this is often, and especially retrospectively, looked at as the first album where Bowie starts to become Bowie. Um, it did not sell well when it originally came out. Um, there is a lo- long, long story about Bowie. Ba- Bowie basically signed with Mercury Records to make money. If you remember way back when we covered Bowie, he was sort of doing some avant-garde music stuff. He was actually on the stage at Mark Bolin concerts, and he was miming and stuff like that. And to sort of fund those projects, he took the record contract from Atlantic, which was not a great money deal yeah. for him. Um, he actually uh, uh, brings in a gentleman who is, is associated with Chrysalis Records, and uh, Chrysalis is, is like a group that's like a promotion group. Um, I'll try to <laughs> – there's so much to cover here. I'm going to leave that one alone because it's a big part of the Ziggy Stardust story. So just know that I'm going to go back to Mr. DeFreeze and, and Chrysalis later. But what you need to know about that is that he actually gets Bowie out of the Mercury record uh, contract – um for this album and he gets him onto rca where bowie would stay for the rest of the decade before leaving in 1980 uh for another record label and he famously said uh something along the lines of you haven't meant anything you haven't meant anything since the 50s but if you sign david bowie you'll own the 70s and Mm. he was pretty right on that because he was kind of at the forefront of that and he wasn't wrong about rca kind of having a struggling 60s too so this was definitely something there but rca was also right because they basically you know got the gist that bowie was going to change his image every year or so in the 70s that he was kind of looking at all this as performance art as much as music and so they didn't really promote this album a lot because they figured by the time they promoted it he would be on to another persona Mm -hmm. and so they were just waiting to kind of see what that was they get a better handle on it (laughs) so because it was under um it was under uh publicized in an era when you sort of needed that publicity, um, it's not like now when you can go viral and stuff like that. I mean, you needed a machine behind you a little bit. Hmm. Uh, you couldn't just sort of, <laughs> you know, you could play stuff, but you're only going to get so far, right? You had to have the machine behind. That's why you hear so much about record labels for, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, etc. So he was he was baffling the ad guys. <laughs> he wasn't baffling them as much as they were just choosing consciously to go, you know, when they got a handle on him more. You know, like what's – like by the time we promote this, he's going to be something else. So let's promote what that something else is. Uh, their instincts weren't necessarily wrong either because, you know, Ziggy Stardust became Ziggy Stardust. And they did promote the hell out of that. Oh, and it yeah. did hit Gigantic. And when it did hit Gigantic – Hunky Dory became a hit afterwards. So okay. it did it did yank it up the charts all the way up to three. In fact, it actually charted wow. higher than Ziggy Stardust in the UK. Go figure. So the record label wasn't necessarily wrong on that, but it like there was one week where I think it only sold like five thousand copies for one period. That's how like low it was selling at one point. Um, and you know, it's kind of crazy to think about, but Bowie was still people were still trying to think whether he was a one hit wonder at this point. 
with um, you know Space Oddity because mm-hmm. that's some people saw him as just sort of a one hit wonder. Um, one person who did not was Peter Noon. Now, do you guys know what band Peter Noon oh. was in? Mm-hmm. It's got, uh, that name is definitely familiar. Mm-hmm. I don't know. He was in Herman's Hermits. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another another band who often gets lumped in with the Monkees, right? Another band that was kind of like, in fact, I think they were supposed to be. Yeah. The, they're supposed to be the Monkees before the Monkees, if I remember. They wrote very ear pleasing pop songs, right? But he actually recorded Oh You Pretty Things after getting it from David Bowie and it went up to uh, number 12 in the UK. And he actually said that Bowie was the best songwriter in the UK since Lennon and McCartney. Um, And he probably wasn't wrong with that in terms of what ended up happening there. So he was ahead of his time in seeing that as well. Um, During this time, Bowie like started two different bands, most notoriously Arnold Korn's, uh, which was named after the Pink Floyd song Arnold Lane, but it did not last very long, and Bowie became a solo um, artist again. Um, there's just so, there's so much about this album. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll give a couple more things, and, and like this period, like it's hard to even narrow down Bowie because the volume of information during this period is kind of off the charts. A couple odds and ends right here um, that are going to be here. Most of this album was done in one take. Uh, which is kind of remarkable. They, uh, in fact, a lot of Bowie's stuff was done in one take. Um, fascinatingly, Bowie was very uninvolved in the production and um, the engineering and and stuff like that on the album before this. But he very much was hands on on this one, and this was considered to be much more his ear. Uh, and that would be the case for him for basically the rest of his career. So it was very unusual to hear that there was an album where he's like, oh, I'm kind of hands off on how this album sounds since yeah. Bowie notoriously was not that uh, for the uh, rest of his career. Um, this album is where a lot of the the tropes that I guess you think of as David Bowie start to become much clearer. That androgynous appearance is on there. Sort of like the combination of the, that they say, always say high art and low, you know, low art, you know, vulgar art on there, you know, songs that, you know, a, a song that can be about like debased sex, the low art, you know, with like philosophy and like, you know, uh, stream of conscious, like the high art, you know what I mean? You can have both on the same album. Um, that's another thing that's on here. Um, you know, he pretty famously, um, you know, wore a dress to promote this. He's he's sort of posed as like Lauren Bacall almost on the front of this album. That's what he was going for. Sort of the, the Lauren Bacall look mm. on the front of this mm. album. If you look at it in that context, you could definitely see it. His hair is pulled back and mm-hmm. he's got sort of the look. And he was going for the look of like a Hollywood actress was what he was um, going for. He also... I guess this is as good a time as any to mention that like Bowie very consciously mentioned um, homosexuality on this, despite the fact that he did not consider himself to be homosexual. He thought it would just, you know, be provocative and, you know, get um, get more interest in the album. Um, it's kind of interesting. And, you know, I, I think if somebody did that in this day and age, it probably wouldn't be received as well. But because Bowie was trotting yeah. androgyny, you know what I mean? Like, I think he kind of was just looked at as, you know, pushing it forward. And I think even folks at the time sort of hailed him as someone pushing the bounds. Um, But he was very aware of the fact that he was using homosexuality for um, sort of uh, to be provocative, I guess would be another thing. The costumes are not really here on this album. They're on the next album, which we'll talk about quite a bit. And, uh, you know, all, all, a lot of the songs have really interesting stories. The song Kooks is actually dedicated to his recently born son on this one. Um, like we said, there's three songs for American icons on there. There's a lot of pop culture on this album. And there's actually a song that, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about. Cause it's an interesting song that many think is actually about his schizophrenic half brother. Um, and Bowie has a lot about, you know, thinking that his, his brother and him are sort of like animus, you know what I mean? Like, uh, mm-hmm. They're both part of each other and completely different than each other. And, you know, where do they overlap? You know, almost like a Venn diagram of two people. You know, some parts are shared, some parts are not. So that's another one. So, gosh, I mean, there's a lot after this. There's a lot throughout the 70s. I apologize for going so long, but you really can't tell the story of Bowie without going through each of these albums. And we're going to have to talk about albums that we don't cover in the 70s as well, because each one represents a different shift. So... With that being said, I think Matt is the only guy who hasn't started us off. What were your thoughts on Hunky Dory? 
Um, so I, I was a little disappointed in this record. Um, mm, okay. I, uh, I thought I was going to love it and I, I, I liked it. Um, and there's song, there's really strong songs on here. So obviously this is, I think I've talked about this before. Uh, I had a double, my main knowledge of Bowie wasn't really through albums. It was through the greatest hits. Um, so things like changes, Oh, you pretty things, life of Mars, certainly very, very familiar with those songs. love all of them. Um, that is so just, interesting, by the way, because I think of like yeah. Bowie as the ultimate album guy. You know, well, like, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that he's not, but my frame of reference doesn't. You know, I, I know Ziggy Stardust, but that came later. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but I, so I wasn't sure what I was getting with this record. Um, and uh, and I also knew Queen Bitch. I think a friend of mine put put that on a mix for me yeah. several years ago, and I really liked that song. That's got a great. That's probably the rockinest you know uh, song on this record. Um, great riff. Uh, vintage kind of bowie sound uh with that mm-hmm. really really like that that uh that song um so the the rest of the songs there were several of them that i was very meh on it just it didn't you know i can i've listened to this several times um songs like eight line poem quicksand yeah. um the last track was at boule brothers uh, mm-hmm. Fill Your Heart was it, it, some of these songs. And I know that this is I did a little bit of reading on this, but it's Fill Your Heart seems like it's like a show tune. You know, this is a very theatrical, almost like, you know, some of these songs you'd feel like this is something that would go into a musical, which I'm not saying is bad. I was just not expecting first and foremost and um, and didn't really, you know, gravitate it, you know, towards as much as maybe some of the other Bowie stuff that I've, that I've known. Um, I did like kooks. That was kind of a catch. That was a catchy song. Um, Andy Warhol was interesting. It was kind of like this off, uh, you know, that, that was kind of like a weird, I don't want to say uh, off like key. spoken word. In the, in you you want to, I forgot this, by the way, you want to hear something yeah. very interesting about kooks. Yeah. That was David Bowie in his mind doing Neil Young, early 1970s. Oh. Neil wow. Young. He actually wrote it after listening to the, I think it was like May in 1971. He was listening to Neil Young. So I can't help but wonder if he was listening to the album that we just talked about. But this is, that was much more upbeat than what we just listened to. Da, na, na, da, yeah. da, 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 I'm saying it's David yeah. Bowie thinking, yeah. you know, he's going to put his own spin on it. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, so. uh, yeah. And, and there's catchy stuff on here, but the, the song for Bob Dylan. So I think, one of the issue, a couple of things. First of all, this reminded me of similar to Jethro Tull. I don't like how some of these songs start off like very soft. Like the mixing is odd to me on mm. this, and I, 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 I don't like that. That that you know that it, you can barely hear the beginning of the song, and then it comes in, and it's like, whoa, what what are you doing? You know, so that that is here. Um, it takes a while. Like I think is it quicksand? I think that's a song that like. It's it struggles to find its groove. I find it's it it kind of does like this. It 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 has a part going and then it kind of stops and then it kind of picks up again. And it's very um it's very broken up within the song. And then the end there was kind of like it starts to finally get its groove, but it's several minutes in. Um, so I found parts of this to be a little, um, I'm gonna say off putting, but not like I I I was offended by it or I was you know I didn't. I think that it was, uh, you know, a catchy or a good. T- I just it was a little jarring, kind of what the way that he was doing things, and I didn't really find myself getting into the flow. Um, I don't know if I ever would. I don't, it could be one of those things where I just need to listen to it more and more to to really get mm-hmm. it. But I did listen to it several times. Um, so, I, I mean, I like it, you know. And there's some songs I love, like "Life on Mars" is a freaking fantastic. What a that song. The first time I heard that, I was like, "Holy crap!" That's just such an intricate, beautiful song. Um, you know, changes, like I said, oh, you pretty things, you know, just bouncy, catchy, you know, just, uh, melodically great songs. Um, but, uh, for an album that's rated one of the top 50 albums of all time, yeah, it, it seems high to me. Okay. Now I, I'm, I am, I must be missing something, you know, and there's probably people here that are listening right now. They're going, this is like, what is, what is Matt? these nuts right this is a freaking classic record and i'm just i don't know I, i'm not hearing this the way that i would have you know something like the rolling stones you know when i yeah. was talking about how much that just that is a perfect album there's a to me there's a lot of missing things here and i was just part of this is the fact that i was expecting to be blown away by a bowie yeah. album that i that i didn't really know and i was left a little nonplussed with the stuff the stuff that i knew i really loved a couple right. of the songs i didn't know I, I i liked and then there were several four or five songs on here that i'm just like eh okay <laughs> so that's the best way i can say it um yeah so that's my that's my take 
I get I get what you're saying. I feel the same way. Um, although I think I like the album more than you did. I, I think the thing about this is that the hits are so like uh, indelible that those there's nothing else on the album that can top those most yeah. famous songs. There's no hidden like deep cuts here. And as a result, uh, you know, to be in the upper echelon of best albums ever, every song has to be good, at least in my mind, you know, in the way that some of the other albums that we've talked about are even like a Kinks album or, or, you know, some of the Beatles albums, things like that. So I can see what you're saying in that respect. Um, I mean, I, this is definitely where Bowie becomes Bowie, right? And I was trying to to think about why these songs are so like classic and what what makes his songwriting so interesting or his m- musical ability. And I think it has to do with the way he the tempos change on songs and the way they build. And I think nobody else does it like him, you know. Change like changes has this really it starts slow and then and then in the chorus it it speeds up and he seems to always keep you off kilter in a good way with his songs um same with oh you pretty things and and life on mars is just probably one of the all-time great songs probably one of my favorite songs if not my favorite bowie song so the and that is just like classic like piano pop life on mars and I don't know. He has this way of, I'm trying to think of like what makes Bowie special when listening to this album and why he's so unique. You know, David Bowie songs are uniquely David Bowie. I can't imagine other people covering them well, at least uh, not sounding like him. So I guess the point is that the strength of the most famous songs on this album kind of overshadow everything else on it. And um, so I didn't really... I found the other songs on this album a little forgettable as well. Um, I thought Kooks kind of reminded me of a kink song. I thought maybe he was trying to, to mimic that a little bit, uh, Ray Davies and, and them. And I got a little T-Rex out of that too. Actually. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's clearly trying to <laughs> with, with uh, Bob Dylan and Andy Warhol and, and Lou Reed, he's trying to, to bring, intentionally like his own spin on these people so I, I was thinking maybe that was the case as well with that song um i like the andy warhol song i thought that was a good one i like the space sounds in that or at the end of that um that was oh but you don't like the space sounds in the in the uh the birds album nope yeah because <laughs> that's a good space that's... <laughs> <laughs> we have to, that's that's another segment we have to decipher like what what space sounds does josh like versus yeah. the ones that he doesn't I, you know and i don't John, I don't think of Bowie as an album artist. Obviously, we'll go through really? that. And I, because I just know all of his songs. And also, I think of Bowie, my perception of Bowie, too, is also as a movie star because his movies and, you know, with things well, like he would Bowie, love you because that's with, what he desperately wanted to be known as, for well, better or worse. Yeah. I mean, he's not a famous movie star, but he's a unique movie star for sure. And, um, you know, famous as in like classic icon of a movie. He has a unique talent to his acting and you know with things like Twin Peaks and stuff he's he fits in to that to that mold depending on the role so I always think of him as from his unique acting as well but I think of the songs also too from just like being on movie soundtracks and 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 just hearing the singles and the most famous songs over and over again so I don't always associate them with certain albums so I think this is my long-winded way of saying um, I like this album. I didn't love it. I think it's going to like rise and rise for me with David Bowie. But I mean, this this the four or five songs on this album are alone are are enough to make it probably why everyone loves it and rates it so highly. So I I have to jump in here because to, yes, like yeah. it's very 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 weird to me that you guys don't think of david bowie as an album artist because to me more than anything like bowie's story is like creating a concept for each period of his musical career that aligns with an album like Mm -hmm. you know and and that's going to be the story of his 70s and early 80s that there's just this constant reinventions 
along the way. And so many people have tried to do Bowie later, you know, to varying degrees of success. And so it's almost impossible for me when I think of Bowie as a musician to not think of him in the context of what was he doing during this album? What was he doing during? Because the whole story of him is these albums, right? And Mm -hmm. the context around what's going on and continued to be, you know, all, I mean, Bowie pretty much stayed relevant until the mid eighties. Then he kind of like fell out, but then he was able to kind of figure out a way back in again in the nineties and then sort of reinvent himself as like an elder statesman in the two thousands. And so the other thing I always think of with David Bowie is he was the definition of a guy always looking to see what was coming next. I said that about Neil Young, but Bowie, really, he was not the least bit uh, interested in like the past or sentiment, you know, maybe to, to find inspiration. And so I've always felt that Bowie, you know, certainly I don't have anywhere near his death, but like he's a kindred spirit in the sense that I, I think of myself like him, that it's like, show me what's now and what's coming. I'm not particularly interested in revisiting stuff that other people did, yeah. even if it was good. I recognize it, but he isn't going to be a person that's going to listen to the same album, you know, a hundred times, right? No. He's always going to be like, give me a new one, give me a new one. And, and I... I'll be honest, I have a bias toward those type of artists because to me, they are what create art. Backwards looking people stall, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you just you just if it's all that, you know, you've basically aged yourself or or uh, relegated yourself out of the next conversation of what was to come. And Bowie just never did that. And that's why Bowie to me is Bowie, because he was in the conversation for 40 years in a way that even talented artists talented talented artists couldn't you know or decided not to be so there's a little context on how i view bowie um here's my take on this album uh which i didn't know super well which surprised me um because i do know and i know this is what a very well regarded album but i you know i know a couple of the songs on it and i i know i feel like every other bowie 70s album better so i think i was surprised to hear that there are a great deal, many people retro, you know, retrospectively that think this was like his best seventies album. Um, I enjoyed this album, but it, I, I wouldn't put this in my like top five Bowie mm-hmm. albums in the seventies. Um, we're going to go through all of them. Um, it's an a plus plus lyrics album. It's a fascinating album to listen to. I love the themes on this album, especially when you think of it in like 1971, like he was, way way ahead of his time exploring a lot of this stuff it's all over the place in themes Uh, and a lot of people mention that you know for most people being this eclectic could seem like an unfocused album but somehow with bowie it seems coherent which i think is a really good description of this album so it's an a plus plus uh lyrical album on a a big week for that because the neil young album is an a plus Mm -hmm. lyrics album and the jethro tull album is an interesting lyrical album as well but even in even in that company this album stands out the bowie album musically uh you know not as much i mean i almost feel like songs like changes and oh you pretty things transcend sort of a little bit of the production um because they're such good songs and because of as josh mentioned the sense of pitch and timing and Bowie really knows when to do what in terms of his singing and where to put stuff. Um, It just, he's got like a, we talked about aesthetic quality, right? He just has a real aesthetic quality of how to make stuff both simple and complex at the same time, which is like, sounds like an oxymoron, but I think anybody who's ever listened to Bowie kind of knows what I'm talking about. Um, But I, I did not love the piano nature of it. I do. I wish Mick Ronson's guitar was up front more. Um, the album before this, it is and albums after it is this, it feels like it was kind of shoved in the back mm-hmm. um, more, which I thought was, I, I it was definitely a aesthetic taste that was by design, but it didn't mean that I loved it necessarily. So I, I was in the middle on this album. I can't say, I certainly can't, wholeheartedly recommend it but i certainly can't um uh not recommend it either it's it's like a very in the middle album for me I, it's I, definitely uh, not a clunker but while i yeah but while while i feel that way about it i also once again i like to put stuff in the context of when it is and that ultimately helps you understand a little bit of this because the lyrical themes how this sounds you know yeah. i think a lot of people 
also you know, knowing Bowie and the narrative, right? I think one of the reasons this retroactively, um, you know, retrospectively has been you know viewed as one of his best is because you know where it leads, and so it kind of makes mm-hmm. sense that you could see some of the themes there. But I think sometimes. And I don't mean to cast dispersions, and I know musicians in particular love this album, but I do think there's a little bit sometimes like you just don't want to pick the one that's the famous one. So you you know, mm-hmm. so you know what what was it? Okay, it was Ziggy Stardust. Okay, what well then what was fashionable after that? Well, the Berlin Trio of albums, right? Okay, I don't want to pick either of those now. So what can I pick? Okay, Hunky Dory. I feel there's a little bit of that with this. Well, I that's what the ed- the Edge picked this in the top ten, right? When we talked right. about his top ten, but he but yeah. he also picked Purple Rain, and that's kind of like the the Prince album, right? So he was right. kind of doing a little bit of both. But that's that's the other thing, too. I'm kind of like, this is a top 10 album of all time. This is a top 10 album. And that's I think that that's just what stands out to me more so than anything, because I, I, it's a good I mean, album, right? It's, there's, there's some a... great songs on here, but I just, it, it I was surprised to hear at how highly regarded it is right. when I know that there's other, I don't know, there's probably other Bowie albums that, I I, mean, I, actually, I don't know, because I don't really know Bowie albums, to be honest, So except for Ziggy Stardust, so... Um, it's, it did, depends on what Bowie you like, you know, that's yeah. what you're going to find in the seventies because, you know, I guarantee you all three of us will have a different favorite Bowie album in the seventies. Yeah. I can almost be certain of it. Yeah. So, but I, de- I can also guarantee you, it's not going to be this album for any of us and not because we just <laughs> like it, but yeah, I think it's, yeah. Uh, did you say, Matt, did you say this was the highest rated Bowie album on the Rolling Stone 500? It's the second or, or okay. uh, no, it's Ziggy Stardust is, is going to be higher okay. there as well. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's up there, right? It's in the top 100. So yeah. I'd, I'd have to go back to see if there was any other albums that were listed, but, um, but yeah, again, it was both here, both on, you know, best ever albums. It's, it's high. Yeah, uh, John, your your comment about the guitar playing, I didn't even really notice the guitar on this album. And I'm going to go back Queen and listen. and that's like it's it. Shoved yeah. Way, yeah, it's shoved way to the back. I'm going to go back and listen to Man Who Sold the World to fill in that gap. It's I mean, a I've heard very it before, but, different album. <laughs> yeah. Very so different. So I'll have to pay attention to the guitar on that. Since and I, said, and I totally see what you're saying, John. I mean, I, I am very much aware of, you know, the nature of Bowie changing from album to album, decade to decade, you know, and, and looking forward and all that stuff. It's just that for, it's not that I don't, I don't think of him as an album artist. I don't know him as an album artist. You know, I know, I know his singles, but he's never been an artist. It's, it's, it's weird. Can we it's revisit? I never got back to like, let me get all these albums, you know? Yeah. Can we revisit? Because when I got into Bowie, that's how I got into him just now. But that's how I get it. Got into a lot of artists, you know, that were older, right? It's like, let me run through their catalog, which is why I think, yeah. but it, I'll be interested when we get to 1980, after we've done something like seven Bowie albums in the seventies, yeah. where you guys stand on that. If you think of him as an album artist or still a singles artist. No, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I can answer that right now, but I think I, I, it's one of those things that probably it was like Bowie. I should probably know him. Right. And like, he's got 80 bazillion albums. I'm not right. going to, I don't, I don't have it. And I, I don't have Spotify cause that doesn't yeah. exist yet. You know? So I'm going to buy that. Hey, here's a double album of greatest hits that span the decades. Mm-hmm. Let me get that. And that's, yeah, you were doomed, definitely you know? like a greatest hits guy. And I was more of a get seven, $2 CDs from the local record store guy, you know, and you could always kind of find some of these albums. If you searched hard enough you you the other thing that i was very lucky with was i had a lot of guys who knew a guy and so you could get like burned copies of cds that i really wanted to listen to and so like there was always somebody who had some of these cds when i went to hear it and so like you just know the bowie guy right and the bowie guy burns you like bowie's 70s albums and that was how I did it. It's like, cause you know, Bowie guys, like you got to listen to all the seventies albums, you know, it's yeah. kind of, you got to kind of know what he is. And Zeppelin guy goes, Oh, you got to listen to the Zeppelin. You got to listen to all of them. You know what I mean? And then, mm-hmm. you know, like, and that was kind of like a lot of the guys that I was around in music is older or, or close to, right. Were, were people that that was how they experienced. So you're all, you know what I mean? You're always the byproduct of the people you're around too. And That's you know, true. for you, Matt, you might've just been, you know, you were experiencing it cause you're like, I want to get the greatest you know, um, overview of all of these yeah. relevant artists. And so you went greatest hits. Whereas for me, it was like, it was almost like studying some of these people. You know what I mean? Like I yeah. need to see kind of like, but that's the history guy in me, you know? And it's but it not wasn't always time. the case. Like, like Pink Floyd was a band that stands out that that wasn't, I, I wasn't the greatest hit. I'm like, I want their albums, you know? And yeah. so I think it has to yeah. do with big, but I had a friend that was really into it. And I really, admired that friend and i was like let me do that so i didn't have the bowie guy right that was just that that was that person in my life um 
So, uh, so yeah, but I do think it was kind of like, there's all this stuff. And I was very much interested in, I want to hear what's out, what, what the new stuff is. Right. So I don't have a ton of time to go back and really get into yeah, all these other, I so let you. me do this. And mm -hmm. that's kind of just where I landed with Bowie. Um, so that's, and I'm excited to do this because now I will have much more context and understanding of where he was going and, and whatnot. But, um, but yeah, I know he's, yeah, I've always very much admired him. And that's that's probably one of the reasons why I'm a little down on this is just because I was like, damn, I was like, I wanted to get blown away, you know, and yeah. I wasn't. So that was my, yeah. The expectations there. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. I get that. What about you, Josh? Like, what's your, what was your um, experience? Well, I don't mean to go too long in this, but what was your take on Yeah, I was just music? trying like, to think of it? Yeah. what my first memories of Bowie were. And it's probably either hearing Space Oddity somewhere because that's such a singular sounding song and with the the narration on it um and also david bowie from labyrinth like i think those are probably the from the movie labyrinth i think those are the two like memories i have i can't sit, i didn't have any albums of bowie or anything like that and my parents that's so didn't funny because really i don't i don't think of david bowie as like a movie like i know he did odd parts here and there yeah. but i almost like he's like mick jagger where like they to me he's like was constantly trying to break into hollywood with like mm -hmm. limited some success, but limited, you know, compared to, I think, what he thought. But Yeah, yeah. Oh, throwback yeah. to a, uh, a previous uh, cle or, uh, uh, what was it? Hot, Cold Listen Hot Take when we covered um, Cat Stevens and uh, T for the Tillerman. And that song that was the, t was the title song of the Ricky Gervais album or uh, uh, TV show Extras. Yes. There was a David. David Bowie was uh, one of the – he had a special guest in one of the episodes of Extras. Mm. So but, tying yeah. into that. So I, I remember well, seeing him in that as well. Well, and Matt, would you say that perhaps that time may change you, but you can't trace time in terms I've, of listening to album sequences? That's that's I would yes, I would say that's spot on, John. 